Good morning, everybody. Uh, again, my name is Vasco Neves. I'm the application platform specialist for this region, and I help Jamie and his accounts where anything middleware uh, occurs or is being discussed. <clears throat> I'm going to start off with a little comment by this guy. Um, I, th I don't know if you've heard of him. I, I kind of know him. Uh, Jim, he's, a, he's actually a quite a interesting character, but um, I wanted to start with this because to play off of Mike, by the way, Mike, we're, we're right on that because I rarely do one of these shows where one or more people, and you'll, you'll see a couple of same slides here and there, but I actually turned off a couple of slides you had, so even though we didn't talk about it, that was pretty good. So we got that thing happening. Um, the idea here is about agility and abstraction and what we want to talk about. And uh, one of the things that Jim Whitehurst, this is a couple of years ago, and this has kind of been refined in discussions that he had, but um, it's about productivity. And if uh, we're looking at the, the cost-driven aspects of businesses, where do you want to focus your attention is to create an efficient environment for developers to be able to produce applications and deploy applications. And if you can do that, and to draw onto Mike's assembly line, if you can make that assembly line more efficient, you need less hardware on that assembly line to create your end product. And that's really the idea. And where if you focus your attentions, you produce things quicker, uh, they're higher quality, and then you can start reducing the costs of the supplying hardware or the infrastructure to be able to produce that same application or at the end, the end product. And this is really what we're going to talk about today, at least I hope to touch on today. And we're going to expand from that question you had about, you know, why do you deploy or can you deploy in a cloud versus on-prem or should you have that choice? We're going to talk about some levels of extraction to do that, both at the application level, uh, to keep developers kind of uh, using what they're used to using and give them all the options they currently have. Don't take those away, but give them efficiencies to be able to deploy and manage those things as they like. So let's continue on. <coughs> um, I kind of put this, I, I almost didn't put this up because some of my favorite uh, vendors actually worked for one of them and it was partnering with the other two for quite a long time. I was uh, with a company called BEA Systems that got acquired by Oracle. I like to think that they paid eight and a half billion for my services, but you know, some people might want to argue that case. Um, the idea is with Oracle, we have a, a, had a way of doing things and uh, the way we kind of presented it. And it was really the idea of keeping you on our technology. Um, at Red Hat, it's completely divisive of what we're doing here, and that is we want to provide you the same technology, the same services and efficiencies that you can be an equal partner in, in ownership. You have all the capability and uh, opportunity to be as influential in that innovative technology as we do. It's really up to you. Uh, there's feedback, there's continuous use, and bringing together the processes and the compatibility and the licensing uh, models that we use here is really something we want to differentiate. So that's why I kind of leave this up. Uh, I also kind of kind of illustrate some of my... Anybody heard the term link library? Compiler? <laughs> so we can see the people who've been in the industry as long as I have. JCL? All right, cool. So that's how long I've been around. <laughs> and uh, about... Six or seven years ago, I actually went to, to uh, one company in uh, back uh, east, and I had been a consultant way early in my life, over 35 years ago. I wrote some code, and we we're talking, presenting about innovative technologies back then, um, and somebody said, I know your name, and that's, you go, how do you know my name? I don't think I've been to this company before. He remembered my name from the authorization section of a COBOL program that was still running. I go, you, you still run COBOL? Yeah. So when we talk about brownfield and greenfield and where you're going to gain your efficiencies, this is how we have to kind of abstract things out, be able to deal with the nuances of what's going forward, but still bring along those back ends that are still running today. And some of them are pretty damn old. So another Jeff Bezos uh, a quote, and I also... It was interesting, when I was looking up these quotes, and there's lots of them out there, and as I'm reading through different uh, uh, manuals or sometimes just articles I see, I also like to pick these out, and some of them are quite interesting. Uh, the only sustainable advantage you can have over others is agility, that's it. Nothing else is sustainable. Everything else you create, somebody else will replicate. And this is the model of some of the companies who come up, the Ubers of the world, the Airbnbs, and how they're disrupting their businesses because they can come along 
without any legacy and all that stuff they're dragging behind them, all of a sudden enter into a world where they're now the 800-pound the gorilla in the room. I also put Francisco de Souza here, a Cognizant CEO, because I've actually read the same comment, the exact same quote from him, in another article. So I thought, who really said this? But people tend to plagiarize everyone else's uh, words, so uh, it's not a surprise. In 2020, 75% of all application purchases supporting digital business would be built, not bought. Hmm. And Gartner's been talking about this for a couple of years now. And it's coming to fact, it doesn't mean off-the-shelf applications are going away. They're going to be very refined to what you're able to do to them. They're going to be highly customizable, but they're actually going to reproductize that because they're able to. The reason you can't go up to Oracle and say, hey, you know, eBusiness Suite doesn't do this. I need to make, create that uh, application change and six, eight months, 12 months go by. It shows up in the product, maybe or it becomes part of your customization that now it's going to cost you a lot of time and effort should you ever have to upgrade that animal. The idea is create an agile platform through abstraction, creating an area just for that abstraction to be able to build out. Now, they haven't been able to do that. Our customers are gaining that advantage through a, a platform like OpenShift to give them the resiliency they need. Is everything going to be containerized? Probably not. But going forward in Greenfield application, you'll find a lot of resiliency in the, uh, the ability to containerize certain things, especially in Greenfield, and still tie them back to your legacy in a very efficient way. So let's look at that. Cloud native application development. Um, we talk about innovation and containers and APIs, because really this is leading the forward march into the newest or the latest innovation. Uh, we're putting APIs, a level of abstraction. We're no longer talking directly to endpoints. We're creating a facade, if you will, that people can look up, just like you look up addresses in a yellow page and decide, oh, this is where I want to send my connection. This is the quality of that connection. This is the performance of that connection. And I might have several different versions depending if I'm gold, silver, or bronze customer to that connection. And you manage it in that way. So you can build facades around as far back as my COBOL application back at that retailer to the latest Node.js or AngularJS or new uh, UIs that are being built today in uh, modern application platforms. Um, this is only brought about through a platform that includes a lot of the tooling and things already stitched together. So something that is providing the efficiency and the ability to be able to not only give you a platform to move back and forth from on-prem to cloud, or a combination thereof, or the hybrid model, if you will, and be able to provide a DevOps automation philosophy or process. As much as uh, what I'm talking about is technology, it is probably more so in the process or the way you do things. That's where the major upheaval is. And you're going to see toward the end of it in some of the latter quotes, um, there's words used like brave and courageous and such, and that usually when somebody says that to me, it's like, oh, okay, so I'm really taking a leap of faith or stepping forward. Without showing you a kind of a, a really resilient or a, a means by which you can do that and having proven that out, which we have, it's really hard to kind of even think about going a certain route when you're not used to that process or used to some of the tooling around that. And we hope you to, as you go, go along, you'll see some of these efficiencies and what we've put together to be able to allow you to do that. So, and something I'm sure you may have seen before, but uh, this is what I call the OpenShift layer cake. So uh, this cake has actually been graying in layers over the years. And the latest iteration is the very top one. So we talk about your infrastructure, whether you're uh, on premise, on your on desktop, on servers, or on a public cloud provider, any one of those, containerizing an application or being able to take that uh, application without the nuances of where it particularly is going to run underneath, because we've abstracted it out using a container, you can now drop that in different areas. And if you're architected correctly and set up, you should be able to go to a console or a dashboard and say, Today, my application is going to run in Azure because that happened to have the best value to my organization. But tomorrow, I want to put it on AWS or maybe Google when they bring it to the uh, Canadian market. And you might want to do it to leverage their facilities. Some have better features than others. They've been around longer, AWS, but you'll see others will come along. The first to create something are not necessarily the last to be around. And there's going to be other quotes. You're going to know that a lot of the Fortune 500 uh, companies today 
40% of them to be exact, says uh, Jack Owen, one of the analysts, are not going to be around here in about 20 years or even less. What does that mean? Well, it means that they're going to get stalled. And you're see some of the areas where they're going to stall. Um, some of the things in terms of this particular uh, slide is really talks about the layers that we've grown up. So we've talked about containers, the management. So Kubernetes and, and uh, Docker are the mainstay of OpenShift. Uh, they provide the uh, platform uh, services around that. And you can now use supporting middleware service. When you build an application, there's rules assigned to them, or there are some kind of business process assigned, or maybe there's an integration level. Each one of those technologies should be delivered at the next layer of abstraction, meaning that I now have my container. What if this was an integration container, specifically for an integration property or function? Or how about if it was a rule, a managed rule, and I can drop a managed rule container right off the shelf? This is what Roar or Red Hat uh, OpenShift application runtimes is all about. It's the next level. So basically, now that you're bought into or looking at or using a platform like OpenShift, the next level is to say, OK, now I want to have an integration container. And I would like two of them because I'm going to run in DR and I'm going to run prod and dev test UAT, et cetera, and be able to pull them off the shelf already pre-configured and predefined for you. All you need to do is bring your logic to that container. So that's the next level, and we're going to extend that out. We're well ahead of this, uh, far ahead of anyone else of being able to containers because all our middleware is now containerizable. Has been for a while, actually. We're now delivering a prepackaged service on top of that containerizable uh, function. So gaining agility, simplifying things, DevOps, and the automation around that is really now extending that out to a, a higher level of abstraction. Ted Levitt, uh, business professor at uh, Harvard Business School. So, you know, I read some of these guys and I go, wow, that's pretty interesting, smart guy. Uh, much smarter than I in terms of these things. And they're doing a lot of uh, theory, but also seeing application. People don't want to buy a drill. They really want to just buy the hole that drill produces. We have to go to the uh, unnecessary steps of buying that drill because, you know, nobody else is going to drill it for me. I have to go get a drill. Is there, should I get a magnesium drill or what, how many drills are there? You know what, I just want a quarter inch hole and I need to specifically find a quarter inch drill to do that hole. Take your effort away from that. We want to prepackage something, give it to you so you have that hole and now what are you going to put in that hole is really what you're discussing. Not so much of just creating the hole. The hole is not your business value. The hole is just something where your tool is going to be, be able to drop into something. So if it's already pre-made for you, you're going to get a lot further ahead much quicker. That's the philosophy behind Roar, basically. Uh, how do you decide which piece parts? Well, Roar or Red Hat uh, OpenShift application runtimes allow you to make decisions. And there's, this is just the start of this, by the way. You're going to have a lot more different technology that can be deployed using Roar. And this is our first entry point. It was actually released in December. So when we look at the runtimes, whether it's Swarm, uh, um, orchestration engines that are really kind of not uh, at the forefront now that everyone's adopted Kubernetes. I don't know if you, if you noticed. Uh, if you were, if I was talking about 12 months ago or so, I would tell you how our competitors are looking at things like Diego and Swarm and Guard and all the other containers and orchestration engines from other products. But all of a sudden, everyone's kind of raised the white flag. You have not only AWS container services or Azure container services, you now have Kubernetes services on those clouds. Wow. There's a recognition. Actually, it's just a, a we give up. Everyone's going to Kubernetes. And guess what? Who's the number two provider of innovation for Kubernetes? Number one is the creator. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. I know you know because you're with Red Hat. It's Red Hat. So we're now influential, not only in the Kubernetes open source community, but those other companies who've taken that on and now delivering, like Amazon, like Azure, like Pivotal. All of those are now taking that and said, no, that's where everyone's going. Why did that create such a, a huge influx or a huge base compared to all those proprietary technologies? Remember the first slide? Lock in. I want to be able to go where I want to go. I want to be able to influence product if I need to. I want to be able to retain the product so if I cancel that license for that thing from a proprietary vendor, I don't have to delete it off my systems. So it's really gained a lot of notoriety and a lot of uh, movement. The other part of that layer cake that we saw earlier, so the OpenShift part is kind of over to the left there, but I can now extend that out. 
I still use this slide, and I, I, I kind of debate, is this really worth it? Everyone knows this, but I can't imagine how many times I go into a room where people don't realize how much middleware we actually provide and have provided for quite a few years. Back in 2006, 2007, and when we extended down past just the JBoss, we have business process engines, rules engines. That's great if we were talking about tooling and technology and basing on your requirements. But now, it's anything as a service. You decide what you need, how much of it you need, and you drop it into your platform. Your discussions are, OK, now what compliance, what security mechanisms do I need to make this our standard uh, platform or our standard uh, minimum compliance? How do we manage that? And that discussion brings you into a value discussion as opposed to a engine tooling discussion, which is really, you know, we have to have something to build that car. We should already know what we want to build a car. As a matter of fact, I should have a prefab door that I can just glue onto that car or bolt onto that car. Eh, I guess I wouldn't want to glue a door on a car, would I, Mike? No, probably not. And all the tooling around it. We have that fulfilled, and we always want to make sure that we're covering the aspects that you need. You'll notice in a lot of discussions when it comes to requirements and dealing with it, how do we kind of ask you, well, what do you want to do? Or what's your favorite tooling? Or how do you want to bring that in? Because we have a lot of options. Our idea is to expand and extend to what you have, not throw away what you have. We'll let you decide where the value is and what you want to replace or what you want to keep and give you a platform to abstract things out, to connect things that are old and build things that are new and make them work to cohesively together. Integration, automation, acceleration. So that's really where all our tooling in the middleware lies. Uh, Kai Reimer, uh, another uh, researcher at Sydney University, and he's done a lot of books. I actually came across this particular individual in several different articles I've read in the past, and I find them quite interesting. Um, disruptors, those new kids on the block, the Ubers, the Airbnbs, they don't set out to beat you at your own game. They completely change the playing field. They change the rules. Oh, geez, we had to be in front of people. We had to go through process form A, process B, uh, group as, uh, resilience C, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They come along and just blow that all away. They create a platform by which you can find their service really quickly, consume and pay for their service really quickly, and provide a quality feedback very quickly. Wow. You know, companies that are doing changes and, and coming up uh, three times, four times a quarter, which I think is awesome, like TELUS used to do, now they're doing one to 200 changes a day. And by the way, they're now entering into that world of reduce or uh, usually reserved for the Netflix and the Amazons of the world of releasing on things like Black Friday. Who does that? Who does production releases in the, made it the busiest time of the year? Pretty sure the financial loses to draw at that time where RSP season coming around. I don't think they're going to change your RSP interface at that moment, but they want to get to that because based on what they're seeing their customers doing, there's new analytical robot tools that do nothing but watch what we do every time we click every single button on every single screen to feed it back to that producer to say, hey, look what they're doing, and see how they're going to be able to do it better. It's coming up more and more. Uh, this is an, an old slide I know, but I, I still use it because the people who can fill that innovation gap, basically exploiting the new and renovating the core through all the efficiencies and the productivity and the agility. If you can't do that, you're going to drop off the map. Remember the 40% of the Fortune 500 we're talking about? The ones who can't fill that gap are the ones that are going to disappear. The tooling that we're talking about gives you that resilience, gives you that abstraction, those layers to be able to go and produce that. That's where you need to focus. Uh, another slide. Um, I was uh, actually at a meeting with Todd, and I learned a word. I actually had to write it down because I, I thought it was hilarious. We actually had a discussion earlier this morning. Um, so you look at all these things. Service endpoints became APIs, modern technology. Uh, monoliths, now we create with containers. We can create microservices, or hopefully we're creating microservices. By the way, is everything going to be in a microservice? Of course not. Any new technology comes along doesn't mean it's a one size fits all. It never is. Not everything's going to be a, uh, serverless technology. Not everything's going to be stateless as much as we talk about it. And it's really nice to do, but it's never going to be that way. It has to be adoptable. We have to be able to take the old and bring it to the new. Now, the waterfall in DevOps, that's a process change. That's how you do things. That's a hard one. You know, I've got my habits. I get up in the morning. I go down to the gym. I work out. I come in. And sometimes I get up in the morning. I'm about to go down to the gym. I realize, Oh, I'm not at home at the hotel. I don't even know where the gym is yet. So I'll go back to bed. Hopefully I'll remember it tomorrow. It's that thing, that habit. We've got to break the habits. Those are tough. 
and you have to create a, a modern innovation. And things like waterfall process, the things that we're used to doing that I did in the past, are now becoming DevOps. But I learned a word the other day. Uh, when you can't quite fit it to what you're doing, just label it enough to make it look like you're doing. So I came up with, I think someone back there I'm looking at you came up with this from another vendor, water scrum fall. I thought that was probably one of the most interesting and well-positioned verb, and I knew exactly what you meant. When you said it, I thought, yeah, I know what that is. I see too many people doing water scrum fall. And they don't want to do water scrum fall, but you know what, you have to adapt it. You have to bring it in at the pace that you can deal with. Uh, microservices, I talked about this earlier, bringing all these technologies from an application server, whether it's Java EE or others, into a web server. Not everything's gonna be a microservice, but there's plenty of opportunity to build that. Telus had a monolithic huge application, because I remember I sold it to them back at BA days. That was well over 14 years ago. Oracle days come by, and now part of Oracle, they were still using it. They had, uh, if you know Java, there's something called an ear. It's where all the things get packaged together and deployed. They had 315 EJBs, each one of them are a system, not just an app on their own, into a single deployment entity. Think of a container, which would never ever happen, with 315 applications part of it. Guess what they feared the most? One change in one EJB. Why did they do that? Well, you know, <laughs> if I break one thing and not everything's together, I don't know what piece to pull out. This gives you an opportunity to redo that, not get into that fear. Uh, monolithic apps had that. Why do they take so long? Well, guess what? You have to regression test 315 EJBs, even if you change the color of one of the screens. It was ridiculous, and they got away from that. It was one of the things they did the hardest. They ran in parallel for well over two years, but they managed to break out. Did everything become that runtime with the service? No, but a lot of things became that and became manageable because they had a platform, OpenShift, to be able to do that efficiently. So the lift and shift monolith, and although I say EAP, it's our stuff, but it's any Java engine on the left today. If you have WebLogic, if you have WebSphere, if you have Tomcat, and going back even further, there's plenty of engines that I remember working or, uh, against or with at one time or another. There's the new technologies. They're not all gonna retrofit it one to the other. You shouldn't put a round peg into, or I guess a square peg into a round hole. I always get that backwards. But the idea is giving you the technology, the platform to be able to do that as you see fit. Not everything will move along. It's not a big bang theory. I think we were talking today, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Plan it out. Planning is now, remember Jim Whitehurst, I think Mike was talking about, it's going away. It doesn't completely eliminate it. It gives you an opportunity to trial and error because until you actually put feet on the ground and actually do that work, do you realize, oh, you know what? All the planning in the world, we miss something. But if you try it and figure out very quickly, you know, that does it or that doesn't do it, you can correct it quickly. A platform does that. Hi, Mike, how you doing? Oh, no, that means five minutes, right, okay. Um, Don Schumlins, CEO of PayPal. Now, I had to look impedient if that's a real word, but I wasn't gonna correct Dan Schulman. I think he's done a little better than I have over the years, so I thought, eh, I think he has it right. The biggest impedient to a company's future success is its past. What does that mean? Habits, legacy. We're used to using something. Leaders in technology, I remember I used to work for a company called Computer Associates long ago. They were the second largest company in technology in the world, only next to Microsoft. Anyone know where they are these days? They're still doing mainframe applications and reporting tools. They have an adapter company they bought. They're just squeaking by, still privately held. Everyone else raced past them. They could not change it. They couldn't get rid of their legacy or change the methods of doing it. You're gonna survive, you have to. Platforms like ours, uh, OpenShift, allows that abstraction. And this is the regression, or the progression, I'm sorry. Middle of our operating system, the old client server technology to creating hypervisors. Remember when nobody would run in a VM? Is there any application out there that doesn't run a VM anymore? I know Oracle will say, well, WebLogic shouldn't run a VM, but there's a little caveat saying, if you have any problem, you have to create it outside of VM. I used to work for Oracle for eight years, and we never had a company have ever had to do that. Just one person, his name's Larry Elson, he just doesn't like VMware. That's all. It doesn't prevent the technology. And that's also discussion, but being able to give you that ability to transition is really what we want to do. And toward the end, I'll chop that slide, is really the platform itself. Prepackaged services. So 
I've had many customers, more than I thought I'd ever have when I came to Red Hat. I've only been here about 14, 15 months. And a lot of the companies are still trying to teach, uh, stitch these pieces together in their own platform. For one reason or another, they decided they could do it better. They wanted to be the next Netflix. They wanted to be the next Amazon. And they're finding that this is not so easy. And they're still trying to get it together. I know one particular retailer from out east that's been doing this for almost two full years. And their deployment time for infrastructure is still over 12 weeks. How is that possible? This stuff is not easy. Getting a pre-practiced solution. By the way, it's open source that you can influence and does what you need it to do. We can talk about compliance. We can talk about a, how do we fit in the security models. Our standards change quicker. We have a lot of organizations influencing that standards. We may agree, we may not agree. It gives you that resilience. Will it happen right away? Maybe not, but you know what? You can influence that, and it'll change, I guarantee you, much quicker. OpenShift releases are coming faster and faster. The products around in the open source community that make up OpenShift are coming out faster and faster with the latest technology on top of them. Uh, the three pillars, really, the distribution, the containers, the APIs, that's the mainstay. We're talking about agility and how do I abstract my connections? How do I abstract my applications? How do I distribute this? How do I create a blue-green field? If you've heard those architectures where I can change something over here, put it in production, oh, gosh, then I can switch back to the other one if it went wrong, or I can just switch back to the other one and go back to doing my changes here. I keep this ongoing. And by the way, that automatically gives you a DR. Yes, it does. Peace on you, Mike. <laughs> He's just kidding me. Uh, George Westman, I had to look up who this guy was, but I thought, oh, MIT, it's a scientist? He's got to be pretty smart. Uh, when it's done right, it's a caterpillar turning butterfly. I thought, oh, that's pretty artsy-fartsy. OK, great. When it's done wrong, it's especially fast caterpillar. And that's kind of like a little tongue in cheek. You can always get the tooling and do things like you're supposed to do. But at the end of the day, only come up with that particular object that's now just a different version of what you have in a different package. You need to have the whole gamut, the whole ideas going forward, what you need to do, when you need to do it, but do it the right way. Um, a little bit of container kind of what's moving forward. Again, the earlier slide in 2014, how we started building microservices to this present day on the far right is really, you can see that container platform, how it's evolved. Distributed tracing, smart run, load balancing, those are things. Software-defined networks, software-defined storage, those are the things that are now inherent to a platform. Those are the things that you decide when you bring them in and gives you the tooling to do it quite quickly. It's comprehensive, it's operationally sound, it's stable, and it gives you the opportunity to do all those things. From a, whether it's high availability or it's performant, you can distribute it. The discussions can go, how do I connect it through networks? And you can bring that into the fold as well. But the idea is the platform is taken care of. The more it takes care of, the more it abstracts for you, you have more resiliency, you do things faster, and guess what? You can move to the platform of your choice. In-house? Sure. A cloud? Which one? You don't have to change it. It's consistent across all those things because they're constant mechanisms. And lastly, from John Goodman, I thought this is the one where I've never seen courage and courageous used so often. <laughs> that means, whoa, you've got to be pretty brave to do this. And you do. You have to start these processes. You have to start these changes and understand the way every organization, and it's not just you or maybe one line of business, every organization can do the process and the organizational structures are not consistent with what we need to do to change. And I think uh, if you'll talk to folks like Todd, and Todd, everyone was right on board. When you said, let's change it, they said, yeah, absolutely, let's do that. Are you kidding me? Uh, I'm surprised. <laughs> I, I, I've talked to organizations like the Rogers and the Bells, and where they look at me like I got two heads. What do you mean that guy in operations can press that button and launch it? We don't do that. It's like, that's what you have to think about. Start with baby steps. A platform is not a take over the world. A platform is inducive and resilient and adaptive to what you're doing. Take that on, um, embrace it, and use the parts and move along at your speed. Without education, without training, consulting to help you, that is a little harder, but it's still doable but I encourage you to take those on. And for me, that concludes it. I'm sorry if I spoke a little quick. I was getting nervous because Mike kept putting up his hands about minutes and five and twos and stuff. Um, right on, Mike. <laughs> Thanks very much for your time. I appreciate it.